name's Jerry Wilson. When I was 15, I got introduced to marijuana with some guys that uh, I had a part-time job with. It started out as a recreational thing, smoking some pot here and there with some friends. And as I got into high school, it started to progress into some different drugs. And I dropped out of high school when I was 17. I'd been in and out of trouble with um, the law for individual things, trespassing, different things like that. My mom tried to uh, send me to my father's, lived in Kentucky, and I had never met the man. My parents got divorced when I was four, and I had no father figure in my life. She thought if she could get someone in my life to, to point me and teach me how to be a man, it would keep me out of trouble. So I left, went to Kentucky, and that lasted all of about two months. When you take someone from the city and then put them into a little country town, it's kind of like putting a, a square peg in a round hole. It just it doesn't work. So came back, and when I got back, I got hooked right back up with a group of guys that I was running with before, which led me into getting involved with a gang at that time. It was nothing major. It was really, you know, getting in fights here and there, doing things like that. And then the drugs got reintroduced and instead of doing it occasionally, I was doing drugs all the time. Marijuana, pills, cocaine, different things like that. And in an attempt to pay for my habit, I started to sell the drugs. And the people that were running with me at that time were helping me to sell them. Put me off a little deeper into the drug life or, or gang life, whatever you want to call it. But it was something that I embraced. I, I had no no family input as far as other than my mom and my sister, but really the group of people that I hung with at that time were my family. What we thought was a game playing around really started to get serious. Carrying guns, stealing cars, different things at the, of that level. And um, what we thought was a joke was really starting to to get more and more serious. And I went to jail for that time and violated my probation. When I got to jail, my mom really had no money. and she was able to talk an attorney into taking my case for me and uh, the attorney made me promise that if he could get me out of trouble would I quit running with the guys that I was running with and at that time anything to keep me out of trouble I said sure and uh, he got me out of jail and within a couple of hours the time I was released from jail I was right back doing the same thing again went to a party one night group of people and somebody rode by the party that we were at and um, started shooting a gun at us. I jumped in the vehicle with two other guys and chased a car down the road. When we caught up with the car, I was in the back of the truck. I pulled out the pistol that I had and the guy next to me pulled out a shotgun. The pistol that I had held 15 bullets and I shot all 15 bullets in the back of the car. Turned the vehicle around we were in and left and had no, no care, no thought about if I hurt somebody or if I killed somebody. At that time, I was it was about making a name for myself, I guess you could say. I went home that night and laid down in bed and slept like I did nothing wrong. The life that I was living was gonna get me in trouble, but also at the same time, it was something that I couldn't give up. I got up the next morning and went by the house where I knew the car would be at and saw bullet holes and not known at that time not one person in that car was hit and a lot of people laughed and, and joked with me about it and said you know I must be a bad shot that's kind of what I chalked it up at uh, as that I was a bad shot I was with a f some friends of mine and as we were driving cut us off and then challenged us to get out of the car and fight I was never one to to back down from a fight so I get out of the car and as I get out of the car my friend that was driving got out of the car and he was running his mouth and I should have realized when the car actually lifted up on the side that he got out of that it was a pretty big guy and as he walked back towards me I really realized how big that he was so I figured if I hit him first it would be better than him hitting me. I'm a good sized guy. 6'4", 280 pounds at the time and I punched him and he picked me up like I weighed about 100 pounds and started body slamming me on the hood of a car. Grabbed a hold of me and we kind of spun around a couple of times and I was able to punch him and when I did he, he fell backwards. Went to get up off of the ground. I hit him again and as he was falling I punched him the second time and when I punched him the second time his weight shifted and I heard something 
snap. He fell on his back and was trying to get off of the ground, but the bone in his leg was sticking out of the side of his leg. He had broken his leg. And I think, I still think if he would have been able to get up, he probably would have wanted to keep fighting. Got in the car, drove off and left and, and never saw the guy again. I leave a party with some friends of mine, another party that I'm at, had just sold quite a bit of drugs at the party. And as I was leaving, I stopped at a store with, um, with a friend, a couple friends of mine. Some cops walked up on us at the store and um, wanted to search the vehicle that we were in. And the guy that was driving the vehicle was a real good friend of mine, and I told him not to let the cops search the vehicle, and they did. They found the handgun that was in the car and arrested all three of us. We went to jail. It started to be like a a once a month deal getting arrested and getting in trouble. And I get to jail this time and it's a little more serious. They uh, ran the serial numbers on the gun and the gun come back used in a homicide. The two guys that were with me were going to be accomplices. So I had a choice. I could either take the take the rap for the gun or let the two innocent guys that were with me get caught. After talking to an attorney and my mom, they suggested that I tell them where I got the gun. So I did. I got out of jail once again with no time and and thought that I was invincible at this time. I go out another night and um, I've got two sheets of, um, of acid with me and as we're heading there um, we get pulled over by the cops and when we get pulled over by the cops I hide the stuff in the car and when the cop pulls me over he asks you know what I was speeding for. I was in a hurry to get a friend of mine home and he never asked to search the vehicle which kind of surprised me arrogant at that time I immediately struck up a conversation with the cop and asked him how I could become a police officer as a joke and uh, it gets me out of trouble and I go to a party and a fight breaks out I punch my hand through a window and when I punch my hand through this window pulled my hand back through the glass and when I did blood's running all over the place and I put a piece of glass through the front of my arm and out of the back of my arm and I'm not realizing how serious it is. I pull the glass out of my arm and when I do blood starts going everywhere and uh, they rush me to a hospital and when I walk into the front door of the hospital I pass out from the loss of blood. A few hours later and, and realize that I've lacerated the veins and arteries in my hand and I'm lucky to be alive. I go through major surgery to get my arm repaired and uh, get released from the hospital a few days later and once again nothing changes the person that I am. I continue to, to, to do all the wrong things and I was raised in church as a kid so I knew about God but I didn't live my life for God. I had no reason for God in my life at that time. For me to accept that God was real would mean I would have to accept that what I was doing was wrong and I wasn't ready to do that. My mom begs me to, to change what I'm doing. Being from a divorced home and my mom was the only thing that I knew. As much as I loved her and cared about her, I would not, I could not stop doing what I was doing. I was obsessed. I was obsessed with doing all the wrong things and I didn't care who I destroyed in the process. I go to a Taco Bell one night with a group of friends and my cousin's with me goes into the restroom at the Taco Bell and gets beat up in the restroom of a Taco Bell by two guys that are working at the Taco Bell. And um, as my cousin comes out, I see him beaten up and ask him what happens. And he tells me, so I confronted him as they come out. And as soon as I said something, the guy that works for the Taco Bell pulls a gun out and sticks it right in my face. And I'm standing looking down the barrel of a gun and see the bullets in the chamber of the gun. And this guy was dead set that he was going to shoot me right where I was standing. I wouldn't walk away and I dared him to shoot me and he wouldn't shoot me. I slapped him as he's holding a, a gun in my face. As I slapped him, his hand started to shake and I could see it tense up around the trigger. I pulled the gun out of his hand and handed it to the managers. The manager of the Taco Bell walked out and I turned around and walked off. It should have registered, something should have clicked in my head right then that my life was in a downward spiral and nothing was gonna stop it. Finally decided to leave. Uh, I wanted to move away and I, I moved away from here because it was too much trouble was going on. Started to straighten my life out a little bit. I get married and um, 
start to grow up, I, I'd say. We find out, you know, after a few years of marriage that, that my wife is pregnant and I realize that my life is going to change and I'm going to be a dad and, and uh, things, are, things are better. I get a phone call when I'm at work one day that um, my mom's being rushed to the hospital. The, the call I get when it comes in, they, they said, you know, I think she's going to be okay, but um, you need to get to the hospital. So I start to drive to the hospital. My mom's 46, so she's not old. She has no health issues, and I, I, I don't know what's going on. And I make it to the hospital, and as I walk in the hospital, a man comes around the corner, and I don't even realize it's the uh, chaplain of the hospital. Uh, it doesn't even register. And he's walking out with this surgeon. And they ask for the family to come into a room. And the first thing out of his mouth, just straight to the point, he tells me that my mom died. And I went home that night and I laid down in bed. And um, I cried all day because my mom was everything to me. And um, she was gone. And, and I didn't know what to do. For somebody who was not living their life right, you would think with all the stuff that I had done wrong, I would have been an evil person. And I don't ever think I really was evil in my mind. But I laid down that night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I felt the most evil presence in the room that I was in. All I could hear was a voice telling me to, to get up and uh, leave, leave my wife that's pregnant, nine months pregnant, about to give birth to our son. I hear a voice that tells me to leave, that I don't deserve her, I don't deserve to be there, and I need to go. I fell down on my knees on the side of the bed and started to, to pray to a God that I hadn't talked to since I was a, a kid. And I begged God to, for whatever was in my room to take it out of my room. It went away, and, and I, I remember laying there and I, I finally fell asleep. A few days later, my wife gave birth to my son. Even with the loss of my mom, I felt everything in the world was gonna be okay with me. I felt like this was, this is exactly what I needed. I started to attend a church, and as I did, asked me what I wanted to do with my life, what I wanted to be, and I, and I kinda laughed. He said, have you ever thought about ministering to people? And I said, never. Not once. If you were to help out in the church, where would you want to help? And instantly I said, with teenagers. And he said, well, why is that? And I said, because I had nobody in my life that ever cared enough about me to, to tell me what I was doing was wrong or, or to point me in a different direction. I started to, to lead youth at our church. I don't talk about all my past to, to glorify my past or, or to, to brag about the person that I was. I talk about my past to tell people that, you know what, I don't, I don't really care what you've done. God can use you to do amazing things if you allow Him to do that. I was blessed to be able to, to minister to, uh, to youth. I prayed that God would bring me the kids that were like me, that, that, that grew up the way that I did. And we started to lead a youth group of five teenagers. And over the course of years, our numbers grew and grew. And we would have events and there would be 150, 200 teenagers showing up to these events. God allowed me to, to, to speak into their lives and share what happened in my past with them. The cool thing about my past is with where you've been in your life, that, that God will use what's happened in your life in order to, to help somebody else that's going to go through that. I've had the opportunity to marry teenagers that have been through our youth group to to actually marry them to their husbands and to their wives. And I'm humbled and, and I'm grateful that, that God would take somebody that had wanted to throw their whole life away and, and use, use me to help save somebody else's. I'm a firm believer that your testimony in life never never ends. It's something that continues to, to, to grow and to keep going. And I became an ordained pastor um, about three years ago, which was a huge step because if you asked me years ago if I would ever be in church, I, I would have laughed at you. But then to, to know that I'm actually an ordained minister is even a greater story. Recently, we've been blessed. God's brought together a, a great team to, to join behind us, and we've launched our own church now. You think that God only uses you in one place, but God's plan 
supersedes anything that we have planned for our life. No matter where you've been, where you've gone, what you've been through, if you just allow God a little bit of your heart, He will take you places that you can't even dream. I thank God every day that, he, that He's given me this opportunity, that He didn't allow me to ruin my life. If it wasn't for Him, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. The rough times and the down times, God's used all those things to to make me a better person. Don't look back, just just keep going forward and, and push forward as hard as you can. And don't worry about the past because the Bible says that when you sin, if you ask God to forgive you of your sins, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. And the funny thing about that is, is as far as the east is from the west, there's no end. The east will continue to go around looking for the west. So God pushes them so far away that they'll never be seen again. I was at a party doing ecstasy one night and um, a challenge to see who could, you know, which one of our friends would take the most pills and I would just keep taking and taking and taking and as I'm taking these pills I'm not realizing that throughout the course of about four or five hours I had taken 13 pills of ecstasy and it should have killed me and that continued to make me think that I was invincible and, and, I, and nothing was going to stop me. Death wasn't anything that scared me at that time. I didn't, you know, I, I joked for a long time and told people that I'd never live to see 30. You know, I'm 42 now, so thank God that he didn't listen to me when I was being stupid, speaking things over my life that was death at that time, and, and he chose to overlook those things to use me for a greater purpose. It doesn't matter really where you've been in your past. God, God's in the business of taking people's messed up past and all the mistakes that they've made and, and creating something new with them. What God says is, you know what, bring your problems and your worries and your struggles to me. And when we do that, we show God that we need Him more in our lives. And then God he uses them in order to speak into somebody else's life that needs to hear what happened in your past. To see not only that, that God's real, but God will use somebody that might be just as messed up as is they are. You don't hide your past, you tell your past, and then after you tell your past and what happened, you let them know that it's only by God's grace that you stand in front of them today.